Good afternoon, and welcome to Academic Convocation at Providence College. PC's centennial observance began exactly a year ago at Convocation 2016. Let us pause for a moment to relive that memorable year, truly the celebration of the century.
Welcome to the Academic Convocation, officially opening the 2017-2018 Academic Year at Providence College. My name is Hugh Lena, and I'm the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs, and I appreciate your presence this afternoon. All of our students, uh, including members of the Class of 2021, our new faculty members, and the entire Providence College community. I ask that you take a moment to, before we begin the celebration, to take a look at the fire exits in the building. Just look at them, don't go through them, unless you have to. Uh, we certainly don't expect an issue, but in the case of a fire emergency or alarm, please follow the directions of college uh, staff and the fire marshal in exiting the building. We have a number of honored guests here uh, with us today, including members of our faculty, members of the Providence College Board of Trustees, trustees emeriti, members of the President's Cabinet, other senior administrators, and members of our professional staff. Let's give them a round of applause. I would particularly like to mention John Killian, Chair of the Board of Trustees, uh, Father Kenneth Latoyle, the prior provincial of the Dominican Province of St. Joseph, Father Brian Shanley, the President of Providence College, Father Kenneth Sicard, who's the Executive Vice President, um, Father Peter Martyr Youngworth, who's the Assistant Chaplain, Father Michael Waverly, uh, Fiona Crayola Claude, um, who's the President of the Student Congress. So we'll applaud them as well, please. While today draws our focus on the academic enterprise at the core of Providence College, it is also about new beginnings, especially for those faculty members and students who are joining our community this week. We have planned for tonight a dinner at which our new professors will be recognized and introduced. That is always a wonderful occasion and we're looking forward to it. This afternoon's event brings us together with all the new members of our community for the first time. I would like to take a moment to describe the characteristics of the 1,068 students who comprise the class of 2021. Yes. You bring strong academic credentials and a demonstrated commitment to leadership and service. 53% of you are women. Your average high school GPA, yes. Your average GPA in high school was 3.43. 220 of you participated in student government. 927 of you completed high school sports, 764 participated in community service. 24% have yet to select a major, choosing instead to explore the options across our comprehensive liberal arts curriculum. We're delighted to welcome you here today and also to our new transfer students. We look forward to accompanying you on your journey to graduation. Today's academic convocation will begin with the invocation of the Holy Spirit sung by Providence College's liturgical choir, choir and Schola Cantorium. I ask that you please stand.
You may be seated. At every major celebration in the life of the college, we begin and end with prayer. In the spirit of this occasion, it is fitting that we welcome Father Michael Webley, the assistant chaplain beginning his first year in our community, to provide the invocation. invocation. Father Webley. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Breathe in us, O Holy Spirit, that our thoughts may all be holy. Act in us, O Holy Spirit, that our work too may be holy. Draw our hearts, O Holy Spirit, that we may love all that is holy. Strengthen us, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is true and holy. Guard us, then, O Holy Spirit, that we always may be holy. Grant to us, O Holy Spirit, the grace to desire ardently all that is pleasing to you, to examine it prudently, to acknowledge it truthfully, and to accomplish it perfectly. O Holy Spirit, you are proclaimed the true font and light of wisdom. Pour forth a ray of your brightness into the darkened places of our minds, that we may have keenness of understanding, capacity to remember, skill in learning, subtlety to interpret, and eloquence in speech. May your peace abide in our hearts, and may your wonders and saving truth be in our minds, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Father. Uh, please stand again, and P.C. Senior Tiernan Chase will lead us in singing the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, Tiernan. Please be seated. Please now welcome Father Brian Shanley, the president of Providence College, to provide his personal greetings of welcome. Father Shanley. Thank you, Dr. Lena. I'd like to welcome all of our new students and our new faculty to the second hundred years of Providence College. And I especially am grateful for Joshua Davis being with us today. Last Friday, I was privileged to participate in one of the groups that discussed his book, Spare Parts, and I was telling him before we started that I think the book was a huge success with our students. The part of the book that resonated the most with me was the relationship between the teachers and the students. Two extraordinarily dedicated teachers and four extraordinary young men came together as a team. 
and they functioned like a team. And they had different roles. And one of the things that you learn from reading a book like that is that education fundamentally is a collaborative endeavor. It's teachers working with students. Where they have different roles in the educational process, but what's so delightful about the book to me and its depiction of learning is how active the young men were in their own learning and how the teachers helped them to learn how to learn, to find things out for themselves. They never spoon fed them anything. They made them work, they made them want to know, and they made them want to know even more. And they challenged them to find things out on their own. And my hope for you incoming freshmen is that you imitate those four young men in your four years here at Providence College. That you become active learners. That you take the responsibility for your learning. You are not here to be spoon-fed anything. You are here to learn how to learn. And the teachers who sit in the front here are going to be collaborators with you in the exploration and discovery that the next four years will bring in your lives. And we are blessed to have great teachers at Providence College, as gifted as the teachers in that book. And they, like the teachers in the book, will draw out from you in a collaborative way knowledge that you didn't know that you had. They will press you to discover, to explore, to work hard on their own learning. And so what we do today is celebrate the collaboration that is Providence College. And the faculty and the students come together in this convocation today to rededicate themselves to that collaboration. And my hope and my prayer for you as you begin Providence College is that you have that same experience that the young men in the book have and come to love to be learners. God bless you and good luck. Thank you, Father. Student Congress President Fiona uh, Cleo, Keola Claude, sorry, is a senior psychology major and a French minor from Dedham, Massachusetts the first African-American woman to be elected Student Congress President at Providence College. <laughs> Fiona is also a resident hall, head resident assistant, and she is the founder of Believer of Words, a student spoken word club. She is with us today to bring greetings on behalf of the undergraduate student community. Fiona? Good afternoon, members of the Providence College community, and welcome to the start of the new 2017 2018 academic school year. I would first like to thank Father Shanley for allowing me to open today's convocation. In addition, I would like to give a special welcome to all new students and faculty members of Providence College. Well, it's that time again, where there is an excitement and optimism for what lays ahead. I personally always feel like it's kind of like a mini New Year celebration, but instead of ringing in a new year, we are coming together as new and returning students and faculty members of Providence College. So keeping that image in mind, a new year calls for excitement, new beginnings, new challenges, hope, some rattling nerves, but also an opportunity to apply lessons learned from the past. It is a chance to continue your own self-growth and learn many, many, many new things. But in order to do so, you must be willing to embrace the unknown and understand at any place in time 
there can be an opportunity to either learn something or teach something to those around you. Here at Providence College, we have what is known as the Friar Four. The four foundational pillars of the institution that we encourage one another to use as guidance in our classroom discussions, in personal interactions, and in constructive conversation. The Friar Four being human flourishing, cultural agility, contemplation and communication, and lastly, integrated learning, are the principles that guide the members of the college to ensure that they are always going the extra mile to fully grasp and engage in their educational experiences. Yet, in being a student here, I know the Friar Four isn't something that is naturally and obviously brought into daily conversation. However, if you have a moment, take a step back and really digest what was spoken about in a classroom lecture, or take some time to appreciate an interaction you may have had with a friend or a professor, and there you will find in subtle quantities the presence of at least one, if not all, of the Friar Four pillars. Now, as important as they all may be, I would like to focus on contemplation and communication as well as integrated learning. As quoted on the Providence College webpage, integrated learning is making simple connections, synthesizing information, and applying what we learn to new, more complex situations, both inside and outside the classroom. Continually, contemplation and communication is the commitment to the Dominican Order of Preachers mission to share with others the fruit of contemplation. Like breathing in and out, we need both. Like breathing in and out, we need both. I love that line right there, and I love it because it allows me to emphasize how education is a team effort, and that team is composed of educators and learners. Professors. As you begin to embark in your roles as educators inside and outside the classroom, be cautious that there may be moments where it is more suiting for you to assume the role of a learner. Likewise, students, as you begin to assume your roles as learners, do not be afraid of the moments that call for you to assume the role of the educator. Because like breathing in and out, we need both. So as I begin to make my closing remarks, I would like to challenge all of us to come together as a team of educators and learners this year. And as a team, let us make sure there is time and space for all of us to assume the interchangeable roles of educators and learners. Thank you for allowing me to address you all today. And let's make this year a great year. Happy new school year. Thank you, Fiona. I now have the distinct pleasure of welcoming 20 new full-time faculty members to Providence College. Please rise to be recognized as I call your name and remain standing so that we can welcome you. And I ask the audience to hold your applause until I've finished with the entire group. Eman Alaban, philosophy. Dr. Nestor Azona, economics. Reverend Vincent Ferrer Bagan, OP, Theology and Music. Dr. James Bailey, Economics. Dr. Matthew Beach, English. Dr. Christopher Burrard, English. Travis K. Bethel, Chemistry and Biochemistry. Dr. Juan David Cortez Ortiz in Finance. Dr. Juliet M. Dunn in Foreign Language Studies. Bing Hang, Art and Art History. Dr. Anna Cecilia Arata, uh, Foreign Language Studies. David P. Levy, Sociology. Dr. Eric C. Melly in Music. Jonathan M. Paquette in DWC in History. 
Reverend Alan Piper, OP in theology. Judd M. Schiffman, art and art history. Dr. Ainsley E. Schultz in marketing. Dr. Shamuka Shavarkara in engineering, physics, and systems. And Reverend John Sika, OP in philosophy. Let's have a round of applause for the new faculty. It. I would like to recognize now a member of our faculty who is distinguished, the recipient of the 15th annual Joseph R. Achino Teaching Award. The award was established in 2012 by the class of 46 alumnus John Achino and Jean Achino, his wife. Dr. Christopher Arroyo of our philosophy department faculty is this year's recipient. Dr. Arroyo, could I ask you to stand? You're here. The Achino Award will be officially uh, presented to Dr. Arroyo later this evening. We're also now pleased to present a number of faculty awards being bestowed for the first time this year. These winners were all chosen from among a number of accomplished peers during the spring semester. These forms of recognition highlight the excellence among our community of scholars, and it's a pleasure to formalize those noteworthy achievements. The winner of the Providence College Outstanding Faculty Scholar Award is Dr. Russell M. Hillier, Associate Professor of English. Russell? The Innovation and in Teaching Award goes to Eric Sung, Associate Professor of Photography. Eric? The Teaching Excellence Award for a visiting faculty member goes to Dr. Eileen G. Johnson, Department of Psychology. The winner of the Teaching Award for Adjunct Faculty Members is not here tonight, but Dr. Gloria G. Mazaki is uh, from the Women's Studies Program. And then the Faculty Co the, uh, Service Award goes to Dr. Jennifer G. Luzzi, Associate Professor in the Department of History. Jen? The Reverend Robert J. Randall Chair in Christian Culture is a prestigious annual academic appointment bringing to Providence College a scholar whose work illustrates our understanding of culture in the context of Christian perspectives on human achievement. Please welcome this year's Reverend Robert J. Randall Chair of Christian Culture, Dr. Michael Root. Dr. Root. It's now my distinct honor to introduce our principal speaker today, the writer, film producer, and media entrepreneur, Joshua Davis. Over the course of a career spanning more than 15 years, Mr. Davis has become known for excellence across a range of genres, from humorous memoir to technology analysis, to investigative journalism, to war coverage. All of our first year students and many of our community have read his acclaimed book, Spare Parts, the centerpiece of this year's common reading program. A touching and thought-provoking true story that confronts a number of compelling issues, including immigration and education. It will provide thematic content for a number of academic and co-curricular activities throughout this year, and we look forward to a discussion that will continue to inspire our community. Please join me in a warm Providence College welcome for our 2017 Academic Convocation Speaker, Joshua Davis. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dr. Lena, Father Shafley. Did I get it right? Shanley, Shanley sorry. Father Shanley. <laughs> and Fiona, too, by the way. That was wonderful. Uh, it turns out that I have some roots here. My father was born in Providence. Uh, and so I've been coming here since I was a young kid. Uh, and I figured today that I would talk to you a little bit about the book that you guys have all read. Uh, but in telling that story, I feel like I should also tell a little bit about myself and, and how I came to tell the story. Uh, and in so doing, you'll hear a little bit about some of the decisions I made when I was your age. 
Um, so, uh, as you heard, I uh, have been a, a writer for a long time. My friend Jose in the back is going to show you some of the articles that I've written uh, for Wired uh, over the past 15 years. Um, I've also started my own magazine, Epic, and have uh, produced uh, and am producing a bunch of films. Uh, but it turns out that I didn't intend to become uh, a writer. I didn't intend to become a journalist. Uh, I actually started out studying economics. How many of you, by the way, are interested in studying economics? Anybody figure that out yet? A couple? No, we, we, got, we got a professor here, so that's a good thing. <laughs> uh, well, for me, uh, I decided to, to study economics because I didn't know anything about it. And I figured that part of the purpose of going to college was to study something I knew little about and kind of expand my, uh, my experience uh, of life. Uh, I'll key you for the, for the one person in the back who raised their hand on, on wanting to be an economist or study economics. The, the problem for me was that I studied macroeconomics, which is like how governments run, as opposed to microeconomics, which would be you know, potentially businesses or smaller scale. So the problem with, with being a, a, a person who specializes in macro is that when you graduate, the only thing you're really qualified to do is, is run a small European country. <laughs> and, you know, Liechtenstein wasn't hiring. So uh, when I got out, I proceeded to make a series of disastrous financial decisions for myself, notwithstanding my economics degree, uh, and ended up basically bankrupt. Uh, and. I had to take a job very quickly, and I ended up getting a job doing data entry at the phone company in San Francisco where, where I grew up. And so the job was, was terrible. You had to type numbers into a computer all day from you know, the moment you got there until the end of the day. And the numbers were on uh, people's you know, payment stubs. They would get sent in, and you would check a box if you wanted to opt into a certain program. And it was my job to type the number if you had checked the box. So I'm, you know, doing this week after week, month after month. And one thing that seemed very curious to me about this job was that if I typed the wrong number in, the computer would beep at me, which suggested that it already knew what the number was. So if it already knew what the number was, then what the heck was I doing there? And I started looking around, and I saw there were cameras, and I thought, well, maybe this is a psychological experiment and they're waiting to see how long before I go crazy. And I, I, I think I was going crazy. And so it was around that time that I saw a flyer for the U.S. National Arm Wrestling Championship. You know, and I was at a vulnerable point in my life. And I thought, well, you know, my life didn't exactly turn out as I had hoped. You know, I'm, I didn't intend to be a data entry clerk. Uh, why not? Why don't I go check it out? It'd be interesting. I didn't really know competitive arm wrestling existed. Uh, and so I drove out on a weekend to Laughlin, Nevada. Anybody been to Laughlin? You're a smart group of people. <laughs> it's not a nice place. Uh, and I found the U.S. National Arm Wrestling Championship, and in the, you know, the, the organizers were sitting there in the front in their folding table, and, and I said, I'm here to buy a ticket. Uh, and they said, a spectator? And I was like, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> why not? And they said, well, listen, you've driven all this way. You might as well enter. And I thought, well, uh, I've never arm wrestled in my life. I've, maybe I wrestled my brother when we were six or seven. I think he won. Uh, but they, they said, look, it's only $20. You might as well give it a try. And I had $20, so I gave it to them. And... Uh, then I said, okay, well, I still don't know how to arm wrestle. Can somebody tell me what to do? I have no idea. Uh, and they introduced me to this guy named Rick Salawada, who was from Erie, Pennsylvania, uh, and was the reigning middleweight champ at the time. And Rick uh, was a little bit uh, brusque with me, but he's like, sure, I'll show you. And he's like, here's the inside move, here's the outside move, good luck. Uh, it turns out it's a pretty user-friendly uh, a sport. It's easy to master, or easy to learn, hard to master. Uh, but then Rick kind of warmed up and he started giving me some of the ins and outs, and if anybody wants to talk about arm wrestling later, we can talk about that. 
Uh, but one of the things that captivated me about Rick was that he said that he had taken his yearly vacation to come to Laughlin. He had taken, I think it was six days off, and was riding Greyhound two and a half days to wrestle for one day and two and a half days back. And this was the thing that made his year. This was the high point of, this, of, of his year, and it was one of the things that defined his life, gave meaning to his life. This thing that initially I thought of as kind of uh, maybe less than serious. The other thing I learned from Rick was that he had stopped smoking cigarettes right before he got on the Greyhound to make himself super angry when it came time to arm wrestle. And so that's why he was a bit brusque with me, because <laughs> I think he was having the Nick fits. Uh, so the event started. It was a double elimination event, uh, which means you lose twice and you're out. And guess what? I lost twice. Uh, in fact, in both matches, if my arm wasn't there, they couldn't have hit the mat any faster. So, but it was, uh, like, I enjoyed it because I was doing something very different than data entry. Uh, and I went to the back of the auditorium afterwards and I was talking to Rick, I was talking to Jeff Tom Chasen, the, the reigning world heavyweight champion, and I wasn't paying attention when they started the award ceremony and then I heard out of the corner of my ear, fourth place in the United States, Joshua Davis, get on up here. And I'm like, what? what are you talking about? And Rick slaps me on the back and says, get on up there, buddy. And so I go up and they put a medal around my neck and they say, congratulations, you're fourth out of four. <laughs> there were only three other competitors in the lightweight division. It turns out that made me an alternate for the US national arm wrestling team. And when numbers two and three couldn't go to Poland for the world championship, I heard they were on probation, they were forced by their bylaws to invite me to become part of Team USA. And here is a photo of me in Poland <laughs> with the American arm wrestling team. <laughs> uh, I'm the little guy in the middle, in case you couldn't spot me. I dyed my hair red to look more intimidating. Uh, I ended up 17th in the world, out of 18. <laughs> and the 18th guy didn't show up. So I've actually never won a competitive arm wrestling match in my life. <laughs> but just by showing up, making that decision to go to Laughlin and have an experience outside of what was normal for me changed everything for me. Uh, I came back to San Francisco after uh, achieving glory in Poland. And I was in my apartment building and I bumped into uh, one of my neighbors uh, and he said, hey, I haven't seen you for a while, where you been? And I said, well, I've been arm wrestling in Poland. <laughs> and he says, well, you don't hear that too often uh, and asked me to explain and I explained. Uh, and he was the executive editor of Wired Magazine. And he said, well, you should write about that. You should." write an article about your experience. And I said, well, I don't know how to do that. And it's very simple. It's a little bit like Rick Salawada with arm wrestling. Easy to learn, hard to master. You write a paragraph or two of your idea and you email it to an editor. And if they like it, they commission it. And that's, then you're a writer, you know, or a professional writer, I guess. And so that's what I did. And I got that article published uh, in Maxim, of all places. Not proud of that. Uh, but this was now leading to, uh, in 2003, leading to the war in Iraq, or what looked like was going to be a war. And I went to the editors at Wired and I said, hey, uh, let me write a sidebar on your war coverage. You know, they presumably have a big team of people covering the war. Uh, and they said, actually, we don't have anybody covering the war. And this was pretty close now to when it looked like hostilities were gonna start. And I said, well, then send me. And they, at that point, they did ask what my qualifications were. And I said, well, I'm fourth place in the United States with my right arm, and I'm 17th in the world. Uh, but they really just didn't have anybody else. So I ended up, here's a photo of me outside of Baghdad during the war, uh, where I ended up as Wired's uh, war correspondent. So again, that 
almost impulsive decision to respond to that flyer that I saw about the National Arm Wrestling Championship led me uh, to this career that I didn't at all plan, uh, which now leads me to spare parts. I, at that point, was now a national magazine writer, and as a result of this, I got a lot of press releases. And they were, all, they were pretty much always terrible. They still are. For anybody who wants to go into marketing, don't do a press release that just says the obvious. Do something that is different. And the press release that caught my attention, of course, was from Carl Hayden Community High School. And what caught my attention about it was that it was a terrible press release. It had typos, grammatical errors, it had like three words on one line and then a line break and then like 18 words. Like, and then you had to like scroll across the window to read the whole thing and I was like, this is a, just a disaster. Uh, but I didn't delete it, I always deleted them, but this one I didn't delete because it was so weird. And so what I ended up doing was just leaving it there and about a month or two later, it kind of popped back into my mind because it was so unusual. And I said, you know what, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna dial the number that's there. And I got through, uh, eventually, to the teacher who had sent the press release, a guy named Freddy Lajvardi. Uh, how many of you have not read the book? Ah, I see, he raised his hand right there. That's early, early lesson here in college. Don't answer that question. <laughs> Most of you, I think, uh, uh, judging from the, the quick response there, uh, have read it. So some of this will, will be familiar to you, uh, but I think maybe some of it will be new. I was speaking to Freddie, and he was very excited to be on the phone. He said that I was the first journalist who had responded to the press release. And I said, well, that's because you wrote a terrible press release. <laughs> um, except it did capture my attention, so who knows? Uh, and he said, well, listen, it's, it's actually not the case that we don't get media attention. Uh, we, we get a lot at Carl Hayden. This is a school in, in West Phoenix, uh, which is traditionally more impoverished than East Phoenix. And Freddie was uh, explaining to me that the news trucks would show up quite frequently, usually when there was a fight at the school, and the newscaster would stand there and say, here we are at Carl Hayden. And you could almost hear the word again in the tone of voice. And he would talk about, he or she would talk about the fight. And Freddie said, okay, fine, tell that story, but what about this group of kids who are building robots at this school? Uh, what about them? And the newscaster said to him, that's not the story I was sent here to tell. And when I heard that, I thought, well, maybe, maybe as, as journalists we're falling down on the job a little bit and we're only telling the stories that we already know. And maybe it's important to try to tell the stories that we don't know. And so I said, okay, I'll come out there. And I flew out there in January of 2005, and this uh, is what I saw when I arrived. The ugliest robot you have ever seen. And I thought, oh no, I've made a mistake. I was like, when can I get back on a plane uh, to get home? Uh, and then I met the students, and you'll see in the next slide, uh, the, the students and, and the two teachers, Freddie and Alan and Oscar Luis and Christian and Lorenzo. And it was when they started talking to me about the robot that they had built that I realized that my first reaction was wrong. It was similar, in fact, to meeting Rick Salawada and hearing him talk about something that I thought I knew and realizing I didn't know anything about it. Uh, because when they opened up the robot, this is what I saw inside. It was massively complex, this thing that they had built. It was 
impressive. It could dive below the surface of the water and do a vast array of tasks that, just judging on the looks of it, uh, you would think would be impossible. And then after they started to talk to me about the competition that they went to, where they were going up against MIT, and, and as you know, they decided, despite being high schoolers, to enter the collegiate division as opposed to the high school division because they were pretty sure they were going to lose. And they figured, as long as we're going to lose, we might as well lose to the best teams in the country, and then we can go home and say we lost to MIT. Uh, and yet, when they got the robot in the pool, they were able to do things that MIT was unable to do. And part of what was so fascinating about this was that they go to a school that had almost no resources to do something like this. First of all, they had never done it before. Uh, they were entering an event sponsored by NASA and the US Navy, an underwater robotics contest when they didn't even have a swimming pool for kids from the desert at a school where roughly 70, 75% are at or below the poverty line. Uh, they managed to scraped together about $800 to build this thing. MIT was sponsored by Exxon, at the time the world's largest company, ExxonMobil. Uh, Exxon had given them $10,000. That was just one of the grants that they were operating with. And so you couldn't really imagine a, a more uh, dramatic David and Goliath setup. And yet, as I said, their robot performed better in the pool exercises. And then when it came time uh, for the interview, they, the, the students felt like they had done very well. And then when they turned in their uh, written presentations, their technical papers, their posters, the whole thing, they thought that maybe they had a shot at third place. And during the awards ceremony, third place, comes and goes. I think it went to Monterey uh, Bay Aquarium, the, the, the team sponsored by Monterey Bay Aquarium. And so they figured, well, we got close. And then second place went to MIT. And everybody looks around and says, well, then who got first? And the announcer leans into the microphone and says, first place in the Marine Advanced Technology and Education Underwater Robotics Championship at the collegiate level, Carl Hayden Community High School. One of the things that capt captured, captured me or captivated me about this, this moment was that the first people to stand up and applaud was MIT. The students from MIT stood up and led the entire room in a standing ovation. Uh, this is the students right after they won the competition. Now there's something, as, as many of you know, that makes their success uh, even more dramatic, which is that at that time, three of them were undocumented immigrants. And the decision to travel to Santa Barbara involved crossing state lines, involved potentially running into immigration checkpoints. And no matter what you think about immigration and, and the topic of immigration, I think it's safe to say that these students felt so strongly about competing, about building this robot and competing with this robot, that they were willing to take the risk of being torn away from their family and deported to a country that they hadn't known since, some of them, since they were babies, to the extent that you know anything when you're a baby. And what that said to me was it, it kind of made me think, what am I so passionate about that I would make that kind of decision? What do I feel so strongly about that I would risk everything? Um, many of us 
aren't forced to make those decisions. Uh, and yet these students were. And so, I think what I'd like to leave you guys with today is this idea that the story of spare parts, the story of these students, and the story of how I came to it is all kind of tied together around this idea of trying to push yourself into something that maybe is a little bit uncomfortable for you or something you don't think you should be able to do, whether that's arm wrestling uh, or building a robot or whatever that may be for you. Uh, because when you do that, surprising things happen. It changes the shape and trajectory of your lives. And today, I think, is the beginning of that journey for many of you. So thank you again for, for having me here. I'm, I'm honored to be here. I think I'm going to be around for a Q&A afterwards if anybody has any other questions about arm wrestling, the inside move, the outside move. Uh, and good luck to you. Thank you, Joshua, for sharing your thoughts. The message I got was, take a chance. Uh, we look forward to that continuing dialogue you just mentioned um, in the areas that uh, illuminate your work. I will now invite Father Peter Martyr Youngworth, the college chaplain, to offer today's benediction. And then following that, Father Shanley will offer the traditional convocation pin blessing to our entire community. May I ask that you please stand? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. O good and gracious God, O beauty ever ancient, ever new, pour down your blessing upon us as we begin this new academic year. May you, who are the one eternal truth and the true love itself, draw our minds and hearts into the mysterious riches of your providence so that as we begin this new year, we may become witnesses of that truth and love in the world and especially in our own community. In this way, our hearts will find rest in you who pour out your blessing upon us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Before today's academic convocation, each of you received a Providence College pin depicting the torch of truth, the light of truth, one of the symbols of, of St. Dominic, founder of the Order of Preachers. These pins signify that we are all members of a community which is dedicated to seeking, teaching, learning, and proclaiming truth, both human and divine. As we call down God's blessing upon these Providence College pins, our foremost concern must be that our lives bear witness to truth. Blessed be your name, O Lord. You are the fount and source of every blessing. Draw near, we pray, to these your servants, the members of the Providence College community. Pour out your many blessings upon them, and as they wear these pins, grant that they may grow in their commitment to truth and we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Conductor Eric Melly and the PC Symphonic Winds to present Providence College's alma mater. Our vocalist today is Thomas Begley, member of the class of 2018.
Thank you to the Symphonic Winds and to Thomas. I invite you to participate in the reception that will immediately follow the conclusion of the convocation in Slavin 112. A question and answer session and book signing with Mr. Davis will take place in 64 Hall from 4.30 to 5, and all are invited to attend. Thank you for your participation in this afternoon's convocation. I wish each of you a wonderful academic year, and if you could please remain in your seats while the recessional takes place, I would appreciate it. Thank you.